All right, hello everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar. We'll get started in one minute. Okay, we can get started. Uh, thank you everyone for attending our webinar today. My name is Helena Mystery and I'm the Director of Business Development for Amica. Today's webinar title is A Brain Odyssey, Challenges and Solutions for Tactography in Clinical Settings. Today's presenter is Francois Rayolt. A little bit of background or a bio about Francois. Francois Rayolt recently graduated from a PhD at the Sherbrooke Connectivity Imaging Lab, otherwise known as SCIL in neuroimaging. He has a bachelor's degree in computer science applied to imaging, image video processing, and mathematics. During his graduate studies, he participated in five collaborations for a few months in other or more applied laboratories where he helped to develop specialized tractography tools for clinicians. His work helped various collaborators on projects related to diseases such as Alzheimer's, uh, multiple sclerosis, strokes, brain tumors, epilepsy, and more. So Francois will present for 30 minutes today, and this will be followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. So that'll be a total of 50 minutes. Uh, when it comes time to our Q&A, please ask questions by typing it into the question box that you can see down uh, below, or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you and allow you to ask Francois a question. So Francois, I turn it over to you. Oh. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you uh, for uh, the invitation for Emika's webinar. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. And I'm going to start quickly because 30 minutes is quite short. Uh, first, a small word about the Sherbrooke Connectivity Imaging Lab, the SIL. Uh, it's important to mention that most people in the lab are computer scientists. So we are developing algorithm and we are trying to develop tools for clinician and, clinician and also for real life application in uh, the field. Uh, but outside of all of those computer scientists, there is a lot of people like neuroanatomists, neuroscientists and doctors or so neurologists and neurosurgeons that are around the lab and want to use our tool in their real life situation. So we are trying to develop tool that can be very useful for research, but we always try to keep in mind that they will be used by people uh, in the clinic. So that's really important for our lab and important for myself. A bit more information about the collaboration uh, mentioned in the small uh, intro bio. Uh, during my PhD, I was lucky enough to visit other labs and learn about their problem and learn about their real uh, clinical uh, data set and real difficulty. I'm going to give two small examples. Uh, one in 2017 at Hôpital La Riboisière in Paris uh, with Dr. Emmanuel Mandonnet. Uh, it was about two more and uh, neurosurgical planning and also some cases that were post-surgery. So a lot of processing related to two more uh, that was really difficult for me. And I'm going to explain some of those uh, challenges later in the presentation. But I was basically the only computer scientist there. I was the only one familiar with tractography and diffusion MRI. So uh, I was there for only three months. So a lot of the problem they were confronted with, they expected me to fix their problem and also provide long-term solution. So that was a real challenge for me at the time. Same thing uh, last year at the Night Lab in Berkeley uh, with Maria Ivanova. I was working with stroke data set uh, where I was basically expected to process the data and help them develop solution for a uh, post stroke data set, which was really challenging because I was there only two months and a lot of processing had to be done. So those kind of experience really helped me uh, develop my uh, ability to process that kind of data set. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to provide a small intro at the beginning for those of you in the audience that is not familiar with diffusion MRI and tractography. Uh, I'm going to do that quite quickly because 30 minutes is quite short. And uh, so I'm going to skip over the diffusion MRI uh, scanner. Everything at the acquisition level, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, if you have questions about it at the end, I will be happy to try to answer. But I'm going to skip over the scanner part. I'm going to give a small intro about local modeling and uh, how does it represent uh, movement of water and how can it probe uh, the structural connectivity underneath. Then a bit of intro about tractography. If you're not familiar with any of this, uh, I would be happy to answer too. 
uh, at the end, or you can watch other uh, webinars from Unica for that. I'm going to talk a bit uh, about the bundle segmentation. So how do we isolate pathways that are relevant to our clinical question, uh, that are relevant to our studies? Uh, and I'm going to skip over tractometry. So how do we quantify these bundles? So I'm going to skip over that part. Uh, again, I can try to answer if you have questions. Before I start talking about my small intro, I need to uh, do a disclosure. I'm a computer scientist. So for example, later in the presentation, when I talk about the brain and the different tissue of the brain, uh, for a computer scientist, the brain is composed of three tissue and we keep it very simple. So uh, for example, uh, gray matter uh, at the cortical surface or so in the nuclei, uh, that's where the computation occur. Uh, that's where the nuclei of the neurons are. So for us, that's just that's the gray matter. And then the white matter just below it, that's the connection in between the different region of the cortex. So you can see here in blue, that's an axon. Uh, it's uh, analogous to this part of the image right there. Uh, that's where the communication occurs. So the gray matter is the computation. That's where the processing occurs. And then the white matter is the interconnection. And then the last tissue, the last medium, uh, would be the cerebral spinal fluid, so the CSF. Uh, for example, in the ventricle and around the brain, that's that's how it, the brain is protected from impact, keep the internal pressure stable, exchange nutrients and remove waste, for example. So for a computer scientist, the brain is very simple. There is three different tissues. Uh, so keep that in mind, in mind for the nomenclature in the rest of the presentation. So first off, the local model, uh, just to give a small intro to that part for people that are not familiar with it. Uh, local modeling is just a way to represent uh, the, the fiber population that are present in the brain. So here's a small example. If in this small spatial uh, position, we have different axons that are tightly packed together in this fashion, uh, this will restrict movement of water in a particular direction uh, and will, be, uh, will allow water to easily move in that direction. That's what diffusion MRI is sensitive to. That's what it's probing. Uh, so if that's the disposition of axon, we want to fit a local model that will uh, simplify this uh, situation. So right here, you can see that the orientation uh, lambda 1 is actually higher. So that means the water diffusion is uh, easier in that direction, which is equivalent to that image. So that's what a local model is. That's a mathematical object to simplify the, the situation. Here's a small example, just to go over quickly. You can see here, there is a crossing between a green and a red bundle at around 60 degrees. Uh, if we try to represent that crossing with a local model like a tensor, so the one over there from DTI, you can see that it's kind of the worst of both situations. Not only uh, you don't see two fiber population, you see a single one, but it has the wrong orientation. So instead of having either uh, one at 90 degree and one at 60 degree right there, you have one in the middle at 45 degree, which is uh, the worst of both cases. If we go to another kind of model like the DODF, the diffusion orientation distribution function, it's kind of a better situation. You can see two peaks, so at least two fiber population, but it's kind of a blurry sphere that is not exactly at the, uh, the right angle that we would expect. And then the last model, the one that uh, we typically use in the lab and for the rest of the presentation, I will actually refer to that one, the fiber orientation distribution function. It's actually a lot sharper, and you can see clearly two different fiber populations. So uh, this is what I will use in the rest of the presentation. Uh, so next step, once you have that local model, what you want to do is tractography. So it's based on the local model, and it's a very simple step-by-step -step reconstruction. So if you have access to those local models, so you can see here the FODF from earlier with a tiny peak and a bigger one. If you initialize the line right there in the middle and you take a single step following the main direction, uh, you get to another local model. And then you re uh, redo the exact same step. You take the following step in either the, the main direction or maybe you can go a bit to the left or, or to the right. So uh, you can see here there is a distribution of orientation uh, which will lead to probabilistic tractography. So you take a step and then re you reevaluate the local model and you take it the next step. And you do that until you reach a termination criteria. So in that case, if I launch a thousand line from this single point here, and then you do a step in the next one and the next one, and you end up slowly reconstructing uh, a streamline like this one until you reach a termination point. 
So that would be tractography. And then you generate millions of lines like this uh, covering the full spatial extent of a brain. What do you do with those lines? Uh, the next step uh, in the context of my presentation is, is virtual dissection. So virtual dissection is, uh, is simply the term to isolate the streamline that you want to study for your project. So this is analogous to ex vivo dissection. So we can see here the result of a Klinger dissection for the Toronal data. So this is the process of scraping away. So you have a whole brain and then you slowly scrape away the gray matter and the white matter until you reach a coherent uh, fibrous texture uh, that would be a, a bundle, a pathway. So this is the coronal adiata, the arcuate testiculus, the, the corpus callosum, and the optic radiation. And this is in a real brain, and the equivalent in tractography is virtual dissection. So your goal is to define region of interest to isolate the same uh, structure. Obviously, there is a lot of challenges in this that uh, we'll mention some later, but the goal is just to uh, have a match between what we know exists in the underlying anatomy and what uh, could exist in this data. So that's virtual dissection. Uh, so those three steps may look fairly simple, fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, even in LT data set, they are full of uh, challenges. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on what happens when you deal with clinical data set and more specifically, pathological data set. Uh, they are uh, adaptation from challenges listed in this paper that was recently published by uh, everyone in the lab. And it's an interesting paper because for years in the lab, uh, we have been uh, aware of different challenges uh, related to tractography that are really specific to processing. And some people in the clinic were not aware of those very, very uh, small detail. So it was kind of a paper that attempt to bridge the gap between uh, tractography challenges in the algorithm uh, and their use in the real life uh, situation. And it's kind of uh, weird because the first challenge is not actually related to tractography by itself. The first challenge is about tissue classification. So one of the main challenge you will, uh, you will encounter when you process tractography with uh, uh, noisy or bad resolution data set or pathological data set is tissue classification. So before you even do tractography, you process those lines right there, you will have to define where is uh, tractography allowed to, to go. So typically we say tractography should be in the white matter because that's where accents are and it should terminate in the gray matter. So it should terminate at the cortex or in the nuclei. Uh, however, those kind of definitions are a bit too simplistic due to partial volume and resolution challenge. Uh, this kind of definition will uh, end up being very difficult for the tractography process. In this situation, we can see a IFOF, an inferior frontooccipital fasciculus. Uh, we know this bundle exists, it has this approximate shape in the real life, uh, but it goes through a stem right there that is uh, going just in between different gray nuclei and a lot of partial volume for the cortex on the side. And depending on the resolution and the definition of what is gray matter, if you use FSL FAST or ANS Atropos, for example, you will end up with a lot of partial volume. And if your uh, termination criteria is gray matter, so streamline should terminate in gray matter, you will end up losing thousands of streamline simply because in this region, there is a lot of voxels that are labeled as gray matter. And even though this uh, bundle actually exists, you will have a lot of difficulty to reconstruct it, uh, not because of tractography, but because of tissue classification. So everything that is in yellow in this image and every part of streamline that are yellow in this image uh, will actually disappear or the streamline will not exist entirely. So that's in LT data set. That's uh, even in HCP data that will be a challenge. But when you reach a pathological data set or a clinical data set with poor uh, quality, that will be a very difficult situation. I'm going to give a few examples for pathology that I've worked on. So, for example, two more. Two more, uh, two more cases are quite uh, interesting because the gray matter and the white matter is quite easy to segment almost everywhere in the brain. And then you reach the surrounding of the tumor. And uh, then there is this area right there where most tissue classification algorithm uh, that work on T1 will fail. So FSL fast, ANSATOPOS, FreeSurfer, all of these will fail and will most likely label the edema right there as gray matter and even sometimes CSF. So right here in the middle, you can see that's that tissue, that's necrosis, that's the edema. And if this is classified as gray matter, you will end up uh, not allowing tractography to go in this region. 
which is sad because most neurosurgeons would say that they want to explore what's happening in the edema. They want to know if LT pathway seems to be in this region. So uh, this has to be identified as at least white matter or need to be labeled as you can track through them. And the typical case uh, in this situation where people say you should go in that region if the FA is high enough, uh, that's actually uh, more difficult than we think because the FA will drop because of the, the watery content, the, the edema will reduce the FA and a lot of uh, tiny hole will appear and you will have a spot missing in the mask of your FA. So even though this is a fairly, sorry, this is a fairly simple situation, uh, correct, visually, a human could easily do it, uh, it's really hard to explain that to a computer. Uh, and then you reach really hard case like this one where the whole anatomy is deformed in the frontal lobe. Uh, you cannot really differentiate between gray matter and uh, the edema right here. Then there is deformation near the skull. And then as you get to the core of the tumor, you don't really know what's happening uh, in between those uh, those regions. So that's even harder, either for human. So that's three really hard even for human, but for uh, also for computer in general. And then there is completely different case like multiple stenosis, where you have hundreds of tiny lesions that are a grayish on the T1, which will typically be considered gray matter also by uh, algorithm like FSL fast. Uh, a lot of algorithm, even based on flare or T2, will have difficulty to say this is gray matter versus this is lesion. So what uh, what is important in those situations is actually to find a way to segment them. I'm going to provide some solution in the next slide. Uh, but tracking should be allowed in multiple stenosis lesion. I'm going to explain why again a bit later, uh, but this is important to correct. If you don't, you will end up disrupting bundle and this will uh, maybe indicate to some people, oh, this bundle is affected by multiple stenosis, but that's not because of tractography, that's uh, only because of tissue classification. Uh, there is some stroke example, I'm not going to go over them right now, but you can see clearly there is a big lesion with the tissue uh, right here. And so should we allow tracking it or not? That's a very difficult question, but in this case, you should not allow Tractography because most likely it's dead tissue. Another really difficult case is for aging or Alzheimer when you have cortical atrophy. Uh, it's important to uh, really QA your tissue classification because of the enlarged ventricle and the atrophy, you will end up having a very thin cortical band and a lot of partial volume everywhere. So the gray matter would be very hard to segment and the white matter would be uh, really are to pass through for tractography later on because you can see here, for example, in the gyri, the, the, the stem of the gyri is really thin, either one or two voxels depending on the, the, the resolution. So if you don't verify that your masks are okay, or even if they are okay, this is a very difficult case for tractography simply because of the tissue classification. Uh, so all of this needs to be addressed. Uh, you have to be familiar with the pathology uh, to take the decision of do I need to dilate my mask? Do I need to correct the mask and add new uh, region of interest to say this should be allowed in? Uh, some solution, because it's not just all problem. Uh, if you're interested in tumor case, for example, you should look into the multimodal brain tumor segmentation challenge, uh, BRAS challenge at Nikai. You can look at the ranking on the link here. Uh, the last uh, three top three winner or machine learning approach, as always, they are dominating this uh, this kind of challenge. Uh, the goal of that challenge is basically just to give access to four different modalities, so FLARE T1, T1, NNS, and T2, and do a segmentation of the tumor in multiple class. So edema, enhancement versus necrosis, and for tractography, this, this could be useful for a large scale uh, challenge, a large scale data set. Sorry. Uh, because you could say, I want to be allowed to track into the edema, but everything else I don't want to be able to track. But that's a fairly fancy uh, approach. If you have a personalized medicine challenge where you have a single data set and you want to do surgery planning, uh, even doing a manual uh, growth uh, segmentation, just saying this overall blob uh, in the middle, that should be allowed, to, uh, that should not be allowed to do tractography in it. And the edema should be uh, considered white matter, so tracking can go through. And then a simple uh, script like this one right here uh, could be used just to fuse a white matter mask with the edema and say, I want to perform tractography. Uh, an example of why this is important uh, on tumor case, this is a, a necrosis versus edema uh, delineation in white 
uh, that's edema. So in that case, I allow tractography to go inside of the, uh, the edema. Uh, despite that, when I did the bundle uh, recognition of uh, four pathway linked to language, so AF, SLF123, uh, there was nothing inside of the edema. That does not mean that there was nothing uh, at all in the edema. It's obviously just a, an attempt at reconstruction. Uh, but it seems to show that uh, the bundle were pushed away by the tumor. So this is typical of tumor case. They pushed away the bundle. And this ended up uh, maybe uh, helping the, the neurosurgeon to say, I can be aggressive uh, at removing the core of the tumor because it seemed that it pushed away bundle. Uh, on the other hand, if I allow tracking inside of the white part and it went straight to it and then it was kissing around of the, the necrosis, that would maybe indicate to the neurosurgeon uh, that you cannot be as aggressive as you want when you do the resection. And that's the kind of thing that if you did not allow at all to go inside of the edema, so if you use a typical FSL fast segmentation, for example, or a simple FA threshold, uh, maybe you would miss those streamline entirely, not because of tractography, but simply because of the mask. Another example uh, for tissue classification. So this is a project we worked in the lab uh, in Marie Baudouin uh, at the hospital in Sherbrooke. Uh, this is a very difficult case because uh, MS, multiple sclerosis, is uh, actually, uh, sorry, there is a fly in my face. Uh, there, is, uh, there is hundreds of tiny lesion everywhere in the brain. And there is uh, a lot of independent lesion that are just not touching each other, uh, spread across the whole surface, uh, the whole volume. So if you want to do those segmentation manually, it's really time consuming, it's really hard. And that's why uh, in that project, we use a mixed approach of manual segmentation and machine learning to do the complete segmentation. And then we fuse both because our goal was to be as permissive as possible. And the goal was to uh, say all of the lesion that we observe, we should be able to track through them. And it's really important to do those corrections because they don't affect each bundle equal. So if you don't do those corrections, you will end up having a kind of nonlinear effect depending on the bundle that are being affected. So here's an example of the arcuate fasciculus versus the corticospinal tract. And then uh, if you do that correction, uh, you, allow, sorry, you allow all the, the streamline in yellow to exist. If you didn't do that correction, you would lose maybe under the streamline in that case, that would be superficial to the bundle. But in that case, it would straightly, it would straight uh, remove all of those lines that are right there, that would cut into the cortical spinal tract, which is very problematic. And why do we allow tractography in those lesions? Uh, that's a very important question. So we looked into it before doing the processing. So you can see here in yellow, this is a big lesion. It would be considered gray matter by most algorithm uh, using uh, you know, a T1 segmentation like FSL fast. The FA is quite low because there is the lesion and there is a crossing there. So that's the limitation of PTI and uh, FA. So because of the crossing and the lesion, the FA was really low in that region, despite the fact that the FOD look uh, perfectly normal. They look LT in this lesion. So we should allow tracking to go through it because it, it seemed like a normal region for tractography. And for those kind of decisions, you have to uh, be familiar with the pathology. You have to know about it, or at least you need to investigate or ask questions with the clinician. So you can take the right decision later on. So that's the first challenge most people will encounter. Uh, aging, infants, data set, uh, multiple sclerosis, stroke, and tumor. Uh, that's really difficult when you're dealing uh, with those kind of pathological data set. The next challenge is actually related to tractography uh, it's really uh, in that paper, in that case, uh, it's related to bundle deformation and disruption. So uh, this is the kind of situation that even in LT data set, it's quite hard to distinguish. So here we can see two bundles. Uh, you can see the mesh represent the full bundle as we expected, while the solid surface represents the, the, a subdivision, a subcluster of streamline inside of that whole bundle. So that would be the arcuate fasciculus and that the cortical spinal tract. Uh, if you look at this subdivision, you would see uh, a 90 degree turn right there, uh, which is considered plausible by most new anatomies. So this uh, 90 degree turn is kind of surprising, but it's considered acceptable. But then you look at this bundle and you see a 90 degree turn that is not considered plausible. It's not considered uh, a, pl uh, a 
plausible set of streamline in terms of anatomy. So why is this 90 degree turn acceptable and this one is not? So this one is considered an artifact due to switching pathways. So that's explained in the paper if you're curious, but uh, it's really hard to know even in LT data set. And then you get to data set like this one, where you have a tumor that will deform or you have a stroke lesion that will interrupt a bone node in this path. So that's a LTAF on one side, and that's the other one uh, affected by a stroke. It kind of cuts short the arterial fasciculus. These are two different tumor cases. Uh, you can see in blue uh, the tumor. In red, that's the IFF on the side of the tumor, and that's the LT side. Uh, in that case, it seems like the tumor slightly pushed medially the IFF but uh, can you conclude that it's actually there? And would it change the, the approach of the neurosurgeon? So in that case, most likely the neurosurgeon would still approach the tumor from the side. And uh, maybe because of the tumor kind of kissing, it wouldn't be as aggressive as it would be because it seems like the IFF is still there and quite healthy and slooping around on the tumor. But the approach would not change that much because the entrance is as close to the skull. In that case, that was a really surprising situation because before we look at tractography, we just look at the 3D image, we were kind of sure that the optic radiation was completely disrupted. We were sure it was destroyed by the tumor. But then we look at the FA and then we look at the, the actual streamline in 3D and we saw that it seems like uh, the optic radiation on the side of the tumor was still present. The shape and position was acceptable. It seems like the tumor was merged inside the the, the optic radiation and slightly pushing upward the optic radiation. So that was a surprising revelation. So uh, despite the fact that the neurosurgeon would likely still enter from the side right here, uh, knowing that uh, the optic radiation is most likely still there, uh, or it seems like it is, uh, it would be the job of the neurosurgeon to make sure that he is not the one disrupting this network. So he would have to be very careful when approaching the tumor to move away uh, LT looking uh, tissue uh, before reaching the tumor, because if you just cut your way through it, you would disrupt yourself the application. So uh, this kind of pattern is really difficult to uh, distinguish uh, when you're dealing with NLT data set. Uh, however, when you deal with multiple sclerosis, for example, multiple sclerosis typically doesn't deform a uh, bundle, it doesn't disrupt them, so you would expect uh, the shape of the bundle to be quite similar to a LT1. So you need to be familiar with the pathology uh, before you take those decisions. I mentioned virtual dissection earlier. Uh, that's really important when you do uh, those uh, things, especially due to uh, the deformation. So when you deal with data sets such as the one I showed just here, uh, you actually deform the landmark, you deform the anatomy around it. So sometimes it's really hard to do a manual dissection because you move the way what people would expect. Uh, when I say you move away, uh, when you define a bundle using virtual dissection, you proceed in region of interest approach. You say uh, the CST should start in the brainstem, go to the pre and post central gyrus, go to the internal capsule, and then you get a CST. So if you try to do that with pathological data set, either infant, aging, uh, tumor case, all of those landmarks would be slightly moved around, and that could be very difficult for a human to do those segmentation. That's why in the lab we use Ricobundle or Ricobundle X uh, variation that uh, I, I coded. If you have questions about that part, I can answer it. Uh, it's a shape-based approach to bundle segmentation. So in our case, what we do is that we provide a template models of a bundle that is uh, LT. So those are four different unseen fasciculus uh, streamlined. And the goal of these four is simply to say, this is what I expect as a shape. This is what an LT unseen look like. Try to find anything that looked like these inside of my subject. And then you do an automatic recognition of similar streamlines. And the concept of similar is very important because you can play with what similar mean to you. So if two streamlines are very close to each other, maybe they are on average five millimeter away. So those are considered maybe very similar. And if you say they are very far away, like 20 millimeter, that's completely different. And depending on your case, you can play with this distance threshold that will allow for uh, displacement or deformation along the bundle. So for example, in the case of MS, when you expect bundle to look LT, uh, maybe you would reduce that threshold a bit because you expect them to be similar to the model. But when you play or process data that are related to tumor case or stroke, you would expect them to be either disrupted or deformed. So you would have to increase this 
so uh, you explore more of the data set so you are more uh, explorative in your approach when a neurosurgeon for example would be aware of anything that could look like your bundle of interest in that data set so this elastic uh, threshold right there is very useful for a pathological data set uh, for example in infant uh, if you expect uh, your template to be very far away you have to make that a bit higher uh, because sometimes landmark cannot even be found in aging data set or infant. So sometimes the shape is the only thing you have, but you have to play with this threshold, which is very useful. Uh, and also it works on, because you can play with this distance threshold, it works on multiple algorithms. So yeah, I won't go into detail of what these are, but they are all different way of doing your tractography. And on the healthy side uh, of a brain versus a stroke side, uh, you end up being able to recognize the proper shape despite the variation in algorithm and even if there is lesion. All of this is a group average, so that's why it looks so smooth. Uh, but Rico Bandol and Rico Bandol X work really well with uh, clinical data set, but you have to be familiar with the fine tuning of parameter. Uh, all of the example I showed earlier, so the tumor case and the stroke case uh, were uh, process using Rico bundle. So that was Rico bundle uh, with some fine tuning and this was Rico bundle X for the stroke. Uh, like I said, it's really important to know about the pathology you're processing uh, because if you want to process, uh, for example, this thing, uh, BST, bundle specific tractography, that's something we did in the lab uh, two years ago. Uh, if you want to use that algorithm on uh, NS data or aging or infant data, it's actually very easy to uh, to use, but if you want to use it on tumor data set or stroke data set, I would not advise uh, for it because the way uh, it gets deformed is not really uh, well suited for this algorithm. This algorithm is basically just using a template of what you expect the shape to be, and then you inform tractography uh, using the template. So you say the bundle should be expected to be in this yellow region and turn it in this red region, and then you do a small uh, enhancement of the local model using your prior. So you have a shape prior that you modify this FOE. So you can see if you combine those two together, you kind of uh, end up with an uh, in-between state that is specific to, a, to your prior. Uh, this is well suited for MS, for example, because MS doesn't deform uh, your bundle, but then two more would actually deform your anatomy. So this shape prior and position prior right there would be uh, completely uh, change. So I would not advise for it. So all of these things are really important to look into before you do your processing. So you have to be familiar with uh, the, the pathology or the data set itself. You need to do a lot of QA. And for the question about the tissue classification or the shape of the model, you have most likely to discuss it with the clinician. So uh, those are the two challenges I wanted to talk about uh, today. It's only 30 minutes, but if you have any other question, I would be happy to answer. Uh, all of these projects, I personally worked on them and or the lab worked on them uh, to some extent uh, in the past. So all of these have different specifications. Some are really easy uh, in terms of processing, like, for example, TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, is almost by definition invisible to neuroimaging. So you cannot see any difference on a T1 and the diffusion is identical, uh, almost by definition, because it's a symptom-based condition. Uh, so processing is very easy on these ones. Uh, same thing with uh, pre-surgery uh, for epilepsy. Uh, there is no observable lesion at first, so the processing is quite similar. Uh, but then MS is very different. Infant, uh, the tissue classification is quite difficult because the, the, the intensity of the T1 is kind of inverted and look like a T2, so you have to adapt your algorithm for those things. Uh, so it's important to be familiar with these things before you do the processing. So if you have any question, I would be happy to answer either about local modeling and tractography and to some extent also the acquisition. So I did not talk about uh, resolution or uh, you know the angular resolution of your acquisition process uh, because that's kind of true uh, for outside of the clinic. It's true for all the research data set. So if you have question about that, I would be happy to answer. Well, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, I hope you learned something. Thank you and I would be happy to answer your question. Okay, great talk, Francois. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. So if you have a question, once again, please click the raise hand button and I'll unmute you or type it into the question box. 
So I see there's a question in the question box from Vera. Uh, her question is, Francois, regarding brain tumors, how can one be sure whether it is edema or tumor infiltration? Both situations can change DWI parameters. Yeah, so this is a very difficult question. Uh, if you want to, uh, to see that only based on, uh, on the T1, for example, or if you have access only to one uh, modality. So typically, when I work with tumor case, uh, when I was doing my own segmentation, um, basically I was uh, fixing the white matter mass myself on a single data set. I, I was always going for, if I was 100% sure it was dead tissue, I would label that as necrosis. And if I was not sure, I would say, I will allow tracking inside of it. So just to be sure, I would allow tracking uh, to be more uh, permissive. Uh, if you have a 100 subject data set in that kind of situation, that, that is a really hard question. And you would have to go into uh, you know, machine learning approach and do QA and verification with radiologists. But if I was to fix one or two data sets by myself, I would always, uh, basically include the most voxel possible if I wasn't sure. Uh, just because tractography will go in those regions, if, if it fails in terms of shape, it's going to be cleaned away by a Rico bundle in my system. So that's the kind of approach I would take. But if you want to be sure and distinguish by yourself, uh, I would say you would have to look at multiple modality and most likely ask uh, you know, an expert if you're not. I hope it answered the question. Okay, great. Um, are there any other questions? Please raise your hand or type in the question box. Oh, I see another one. So it did answer Vera's question. I see another question from Danielle. Uh, Thanks for the amazing talk. What are the pitfalls of eroding, dilating white matter mass to allow for more comprehensive tract uh, tractogram generation? Is it not dangerous to modify the classified segmented label masks? Yeah, so uh, one of the reasons why this could work is uh, if you have a knowledge of uh, what you're doing specifically in that data set. For example, when you're doing, uh, I don't know, aging data set and there is some atrophy at the cortex and you know that there is partial volume because your resolution is quite bad. Uh, if you do a dilation and your resolution is two by two by two, uh, you will end up including a way too much voxel because the size of the voxel you are doing your dilation is two millimeter. Uh, so that's the kind of situation where you shouldn't do it. Uh, if your resolution is quite high, uh, typically what I do personally is I dilate my white matter and everything that is gray matter uh, that is now I need to explain this clearly because your goal is not to go inside of the CSF, for example. So what you want to do is to dilate your white matter into your gray matter. So you don't want to include CSF and you don't want to go outside of your gray matter. So you need to have a dilation approach that would just extend by one voxel. Let's say your voxel size is one millimeter. You want to extend your white matter by one millimeter into your gray matter only and exclude your gray matter and exclude your CSF, sorry. And that's a kind of a small detail that very often only a computer scientist can do. So that's why sometimes computer scientists are useful in the clinical world, uh, those kind of approach. Recently with Maggie Roy, we worked on uh, aging data uh, where we were aware of the fornix. Uh, that was a very difficult challenge. So what we did is that we dilated the white matter into the gray matter, like I just mentioned, but we also use a template-based approach to say, if you're not sure uh, of your white matter, gray matter segmentation in your subject, uh, inform yourself using a template that will register uh, to the data set. So we use a template approach to correct the mask on top of a dilation into gray matter. So all of this is basically fine-tuning, but when you're doing a 100 subject processing, uh, you need to apply that equally to everyone. So you need to fine tune those kind of decisions. But I agree that a, a blind dilation of white matter in every direction would be dangerous if you if you are not uh, careful about it. Okay, great. So are there any more questions? We'll wait a few minutes.
Okay, I don't see any more questions, so uh, we'll end this webinar. We'll be following up with everyone with a very brief uh, questionnaire or a survey, and I promise it's very brief and short, probably two minutes to fill out. So if you could fill that out and send it back to us, it really helps us plan for future webinars. Um, so that would be very helpful. So I would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar today. And I hope you found it very useful and we look forward to receiving your feedback and seeing you in, in the future. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Francois. This was great. Have Thank a you. great day. You too. Bye.